Welcome to the second issue of the new weekly feature, Tees Life's Borough Backtrack, in association with Domino's Teesside. Before I introduce this week's guest, not that he'll need too much of an introduction, it's a fact that football and pizza are two of the best things in life, and we're grateful to the support of Domino's Teesside for helping bring the two together with their support of Borough Backtrack. Now, I'm Dave Allen. This week, I'm jo joined by a true Borough legend, born on Teesside, made on Teesside, played for the Borough, managed the Borough, lives in the Borough, he even filled his Blackburn squad with players who used to be with the Borough. Here he is, Mr Middlesbrough. I'm talking, of course, Tony Mowbray. Welcome, Tony. Nice to see you all. Good to see you, Dave. Looking so, fit. Mogger, we're ready for a, a good chat ab about things. And before we get to that and start talking about all things, all things Borough and the past, right now, of course, we're all in unusual times. How are you finding lockdown? Oh um, well, the first month or so was was um, was was all right to be honest. I played a lot of stuff in the garden. The weather was really nice. I've got three boys who are ten, thirteen, and fifteen, and so a lot of footy in the garden, um, a lot of running about, a lot of um, remembering my maths homework and stuff like that. How to do fractions and stuff. So um, yeah, it was okay. The last few weeks have been really intense with work and trying to put the plans together to get back to training really. Um, a lot of Zoom meetings with my chief executive and with my players in the mornings. Um, at, at this moment, every minute of the day seems to be full of trying to get all the logistics right for going back to training of how you're doing the testing, how you're keeping the distancing, when you have to sanitise things, where you can go, who's coming in for testing, what days you're testing. So much to do. It's, um, it's a busy period, but um, I think you know, for everybody's safety, we have to do it. The players have to feel safe and that we're trying to make them feel that we've given them the very best we can. And um, So, yeah, it's, it's a busy period at the moment. What are you looking forward to getting back to it? Since I left school, all I've ever done is football, really. and. Um, yeah, you get like withdrawal symptoms almost. You know, it's uh, trying to keep trying to keep your mind going. I try and stay to as I always have really. I try and stay to a, a pattern. I put some um, sort of organisation in my life. My alarm goes off at seven o'clock every morning. I get up. I run. I keep fit. I do exercise um, just to get the day going really, and then I'll take the wife a cup of tea and we'll have breakfast the kids will get up for school and so there's a bit of order really then my day starts with my chief executive and the players and as I say I'm, at the moment I'm preparing drills for the first week where you have to you have to distance each other really the groups of five and keeping away from each other and it's not easy to put them sort of drills together it's going to be a real challenge so I'm going to take you back now a few years. I think it was an 18-year-old Tony Mowbray made his Borough debut at St James's Park and marking a certain <laughs> Kevin Keegan. What do you remember about that day? Well, I remember the excitement of the first few days before it really. I think Paul Ward made his debut on the same night, I think. And um, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, my career had been out of school, working really hard, you know, surrounded by some amazing footballers, really, you know, Craig Johnson's and David Hodgson's, Matt Proctor's, and the team was sort of not disintegrating, but, you know, those sort of players didn't have long left, really, I think, uh, they'd already, they might have even gone by the time I made my debut, but when I'd left school, they were still there, and... Um, team was almost disintegrating from John Neal's really talented, young, borough, athletic, clever, good footballing team um, to more of a journeyman football team as, as the money wasn't there to keep these players and they got tempted away. So I found myself, um, as the team was, you know, if we've been realistic, was, was, was getting less talented with the loss of Proctor and Hodgson and Johnson and Spike Armstrong and all them players left. And so I was fortunate enough, if that's what you say, to, to force my way in almost through 
I was probably next one in really and uh, there must have been some injuries around the time but I just remember the excitement of thinking God I'm, I'm actually going to play against Newcastle Keegan Mickey Shannon was the other striker that night and um, you know and everybody remembers Mickey Shannon who this wheeling arm after he'd ever scored for England or Southampton and uh, the yeah, two England strikers, that's, that, that's easy enough, isn't it? Well, <laughs> you, you fight the demons, I think. How do you deal with it? You fight the demons. You're just hoping and praying that you don't get embarrassed, really. Keegan doesn't stick it through your legs on the other side and score one in the top corner. You know, I, the focus and the concentration was as high as it had ever been in my life. Just to run out at St. James, 33,000, I think, was there. It's... Um, and Kevin Keegan, the night, I remember the night because I, afterwards we got a one-all draw. I remember thinking he never took me on once. Really. He never attacked me. He never got turned and ran at me. And um, he got it into feet enough and he laid it off. I was always right there, right behind him, trying to poke it through his legs or nick it away. And he just laid it off. And um, I came off feeling I'd done all right. Didn't get exposed. Felt comfortable. You had him in your pocket. Well, I did. I'm sure I didn't. Listen, I, I'm a football student, really, and Kevin Keegan was an amazing footballer, you know. Obviously for Liverpool, and then went off to, to Hamburg and, and, and got European Player of the Year and stuff. He was coming at the end of his career by the time he got to Newcastle. But um, still a great technician, still a brilliant athlete, still a great, sharp footballer. But I, I just did what I had to do that night, concentrated, focused, won my headers, and, and kept it as simple as I could. You managed to mention my two boyhood heroes in your opening minutes, so you've already mentioned Kevin Keegan and Craig Johnston, my two heroes yeah. of my youth, so well done on that one. Uh, there's, a, there's a theme going to develop here that you've already brought up, and that is, you seem to get your chance when the money runs out. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I don't know. Listen, but that's life, and in, in, in a lot of footballers have had their opportunity through adversity at a football club. Sometimes I say that to our young players, if we have even you know, a Blackburn, now your chance might come. You're only one injury away, by the way, because we aren't full of footballers at Blackburn Rovers. It's, um, young players have to be always ready. I'm preparing a little speech to the, the 10 young under-23s that are actually at the moment doing all the running and the fitness work with our team individually, that they have to keep that going. Because if we need them when this nine-game run starts, because we might get lots of injuries and... You know, niggles, muscle strains. If we're playing three games a week, they have to be ready. And um, so, who knows that another young player at Blackburn might make his debut over the next few months? And, and then it's down to their talent, of course, their drive, their desire, their commitment. They have to have it in the belly, really, that they once they get the chance, they have to grab it. You grabbed your chance, didn't you, Borough? As, as a young lad, you went on and became a, a regular over the seasons that, um, that followed that. But of course, it was really. It was really tough times under Willie Madron. Uh, Poo, Poo, Poo Willie had a, re a really tough time with no budget whatsoever. I think he was even yeah. driving the team bus at one point with David Mills. But the um, and then eventually we we did go into liquidation in the summer of '86, didn't we? And uh, you know, I'd be interested in what you remember about that. And I, I seem to recall that were you aware that there was a bid from Oldham, a thirty grand bid from Oldham that came in for you, and that you you could have been off to Lancashire? No, nobody ever told me that. I think um, I think the talk was about our group really sticking together. Of course, we weren't. When you say sticking together, it was through the summer. There was no zooms for the players to to talk to each other on online and stuff like that in the middle eighties. And um, I was a good lad. I had no intention of leaving at that stage. My chance, you know, I'd, I'd been playing. For a few years, on and off, I'd, I'd got in the team. I'd sort of cemented my place. I think um, I only ever wanted to stay at Pura and Nobody ever put it directly to me. Nobody ever suggested we need the 30 grand off. That's what it was and, and the, what you think of Oldham. And so I just got on with it, really. The things I remember about them summers... You know, like today, everybody's got branded football kits and stuff like that, and everybody's got club gear everywhere. It's, um, I used to have an old baggy pair of blue tracky bottoms like Alibaba really. They were um, they were really tight at the bottom and yet really baggy when I pulled them up. And we wore our own kit. We used to drive to work, park outside the, the padlocked gates and, and wait for Bruce and Toddy to tell us where we were going. Not we to Albert Park often. 
Albert Park, back of Billingham St. Donia, um, down the avenue at, uh, in Acklam. We just we didn't know where we were going really, and, and some days we uh, we just got there, and some lads didn't know where it was if they were from I don't know if if, if they were from the colliery area or something like that up up north they wouldn't know some of the places we were going to, and they'd have to like be a convoy of cars to get to the train centre or wherever we were training. So they'd be getting lost on the way and see yeah. what time people turn up. Yeah, right. Well, so we were training on school school fields, like you said, and I remember thinking the bell went for dinner time once and all the people at Acklam, all the kids, all the school kids, the team were training on Acklam pitches and the school kids were running over because lunchtime had started and we had to finish the session and otherwise we just got ran over by 100, 100 kids <laughs> all come running over to watch training. But um, that was, that was to be fair, it was like that in my first management job when I got the kids, we were training on school pitches and, and asking schools if we could borrow a bit of grass whilst the kids were in the lessons. Some of those kids might have got a game if they'd, if they'd have uh, brought the shorts and the boots. The, um, yeah. so, I mean, we came through that, or through, you know, Steve Gibson led it and a bit like Colin Henderson at that time, yeah. brought us through the liquidation, we survived it, and then somehow Bruce Rio created this team, this winning team with a winning mentality there from what was a lot of young kids. I think you were, were you 21, 22 and probably mm -hmm. one of the oldest in the team apart from maybe Archie and Bernie. And, yeah. you, and yet, I mean, that, that, I think that defence in particular that you were part of is legendary with, you know, Pears, Parkinson, Cooper, Pallister, yeah. Mowbray. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what's your memories of that, that defence? Oh, um, all had a good connection, all, all were good lads, all honest, hard-working lads. I think, um, you know, Parky probably come out the youth team the year before. I don't know what it, I don't know how many games Parky had played, if he played any. You know, he never season. played any until that season. No. I'm assuming Coop should have played a few, you know. Yeah. I, yeah um, but not many. Pally, obviously, you remember the day Pally was driving, really, you know, bef before Bruce, well, you imagine, brought him in, didn't he? But... Um, just a big lanky kid with a bit uncoordinated, you know what I mean? And you think of the career that he's had and what he he's achieved. He's done all right for doing. himself. Oh, amazing, amazing. But rightly so as well because of the attributes and the qualities he possessed. But um, I think I think Bruce and Toddy did a lot of work really um, with the group. I think the, the natural affinity of, of the lads was there really. There wasn't too much team building stuff going on. I think out of the adversity of it, you stick together, you you create a bond really like that's the, the glue that sticks you together because we were all having to go to town hall and pick up our wages in cash in brown envelopes and waiting a queue to get the money and um, I was probably just past getting on the 263 from Redcar then but um, I wasn't long out of getting on the 263 every day from Redcar to get to training but um, yeah, they were they were great days. Them them lads you mentioned, the fantastic lads, you know. And you had other players like it was like Gary Hamilton. That was a real glue of that team, a real personality that would stick it all together. And um, and then particularly a bit later when when Nucky came and and Bertie came and Dean Glover came, you know, they joined in as if they'd been with us all all forever, really. And yeah, it became the Borough and Aston, Aston Villa squad, didn't it? The, um, by the way, I've got. I should. I have to remember. Gary Hamilton has said that I have to give you his love. So. All right, he's a great guy. I roomed with Ami for a lot of years, and he's a Glaswegian. He's, he calls it as it is. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. He, what what you knew is you got hundred percent of family every single game, every minute. He, he, the, the way he played through such pain at times, his knees were really struggling at times, and yet what a warrior, what a player, what a what a person to have in your dressing room. Played his last game for the Borough, for, or for any club, at age 24, with 250 games behind him already. Yeah, um, what, a, what a man he is. He's, you know, he, he's, um, I, was, I don't know, I can't remember how long ago it was now. I remember he, he's obviously put a bit of weight on, hasn't he, and stuff like that. And he had, I remember him rolling out at the Riverside in a, in a, in a, in a game, a charity game. It's, Wow, you know, just it epitomised it for me. I sat on the bench that, that day, and I think Bruce managed to do the team, but just I mean, just loved football, and it was just you know, it was crying shame if you're saying he ever he played his last ever game at 24. I mean, what a loss to the game because he was brilliant for them years with us. He'd have had a, he'd had a few more years left in him, I think. The um, 
I mean, that, that squad, and you, you can tell by the way you're talking about it, there was a special unity, and you, you've stuck together, haven't you, over the years? I'm not saying you're all best mates, but you are pretty good mates. Is this right yeah. that you meet up with, uh, in normal times, you meet up with a certain Mr Pallister once a week? Oh, yeah, once or twice a week, depending on how many days off I give the team. I'll, whenever I'm on side in the morning, I'll get up, drop the kids at school, and I'll go and have a coffee for an hour or two with Pally and ask him what's happening, seeing how the butter's been, if he's beat the butter match that weekend, see how Man United are doing, if he's been Old Trafford, and um, just talk football, really. He's, he's, um, I think he likes us, some footballers like to talk football at, uh, sometimes in. You're happy to talk to everybody else and be polite and chat about life and the weather, but it's great to talk about football to the people that you know well. And uh, my relationship with Pallies was, was born out of those, I, I don't know how many years, four or five years or whatever it was together that we played. And um, it's amazing that all these years later, you, 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 you see each other and it's like you, you've got a game this weekend together. It's the, the, the connection's really special. Yeah, it's great. That's it. And the, I'm going to ask you, because there was a certain style, shall we say, <laughs> about that era. And I've been, uh, I, did, I did ask a, a few Borough fans what I should be asking Tony Mowbray this week. And <laughs> one of them that came up, I have to ask you about your, your blonde ha- highlights mm. of that, that time. And now, yeah. apparently rumour has it that you and Stuart Ripley would go halves in a bottle of peroxide. <laughs> Is this true? <laughs> no. No, that's not true. Uh, I think Ripper's, Ripper's probably naturally blonde, I think. Ripper, I, I see, Stuart lives, he lives literally 400 yards from our training ground at Blackburn, Ripper's. And Is so really? I've invited him in a few times. He's obviously a very bright, intelligent guy. He's a lawyer. He works, you know, consultancy for the FA and, and the uh, LMA and stuff like that. Um, He's a great guy, Ripper's. But um, no, I think Stuart's naturally blonde. I wasn't naturally blonde. Hoops wasn't. Coops wasn't no. I'm, I'm just, there'll, there'll be a few, I'm sure. That um, there was no connection really. I think I was 22, 23, 24 through that era. I think of blonde hair because as I've been going through the garage, I found some pictures and programs and stuff. And I used to have this huge, huge flick sort of right up of blonde hair that was falling away. It was the um, girls loved it, Margaret. Did that? I don't know, mate. I wasn't. Uh, you know, it's. I think I think that I think I, I was trying to think back. I think um, I think it was actually my girlfriend that would do it. She'd put one of them caps on and she'd stick one of them needle things in and pull it out, and then she'd put all that peroxide stuff on it, um, and then it'd be done. And so I don't think I've ever been to a, a hairdresser's or a barber's to get colour put in my hair. I think they were home home peroxide jobs, really. So you weren't too far away, really, on a bottle of peroxide. But, um, not needed and nowadays, though, no. Too much grey now, mate. Um, but, yeah, listen, I, appearance as a young guy. I know Lee Turnbull was being in touch with me recently quite a bit and uh, asking how it's going and just how, how he's safe. And so he's a great guy, Lee, as well. I mean, a, a lad who was on the periphery of that squad, really, and yet still very, very important and very much a part of it. And so he keeps in touch with everybody and... Um, he was commenting on my fashion sense of the in the eighties, really, and my haircuts. But uh, I sent him some pictures; very nice they were too, in oversized jackets and suits. And I was at uh, actually it was my testimonial at, at Red Careers. I had this like bright peach suit on with a ridiculous flicked haircut. But um, never mind, and a suntan in sunny red care. You'll have to send them to us. We'll show the rest yeah. of the fans that. Yeah, right. the, the man about town. <laughs> Now, I'm going to, everybody, I think there's, if there's one name that everybody thinks of when you think of that for a team, it's a certain Bruce Rioch, the manager. Yeah. And I'd love to get your, you know, your thoughts on, because you having become a manager, I mean, you actually played at, at the Borough, you played under, I think you came through under Bobby Murdoch under, in the yeah. youth team, I assume, and then you, you got in under Big Mal, Malcolm Allison, you had yeah. Willie Madron, yeah. Bruce Rioch, and then you went on to play under Colin Todd and then um, a little bit under Lenny Lawrence as well. I mean, yeah. all probably different managers. Did, did, did you pick up, did you, did you ever th- find yourself thinking, that's what, how, what Bruce would have done or that's what, uh, how big Mal was? Or is it just mm. you are no. what you are? 
Oh, I think I think as a football manager, you you can't kid players on. You have to be who you are. You have to use your own personality. You know, people often ask, ask that question. You know, who you most like? Who do you copy? What do you think? Listen, if it was as easy as copying, we'd all be looking at Guardiola and Klopp every week and trying to copy them. And yet, you can't copy. You have to be yourself. Players, players see falseness. They see the um, if it's not true. If if you're not. If you, I call it spiel. If you're giving a manager spiel, players know. They uh, they go out of your office and they go, I've heard it all before. But me, I like to be open. I like to be honest. I think you have to you have to analyse and take the good bits and the bad bits from every coach. So Malcolm Allison, he used to do really weird things in training, really. We'd, a session might be a game of table tennis with everybody around the table. And as somebody overhit a shot, you'd have to dive off your chair and stop the ball in the floor. Why? Well, because of sharpness and your movement and how you'd use that. He had me with Lenny Heppel, like a ballerina, a ballet dancer, out showing me how to get off a seat and how to walk through a door and um, how I'd throw my shoulders on my head first. And I took them things from Malcolm, like diversity of training, really. Went to mix it up. Don't keep doing the same sessions all the time. Some, some, sometimes throw some of it in. Sometimes they come in, think they're going to work hard, and take them for a walk in the country and give them an ice cream or a burger or something, you know, and, and just let them chat and feel, and so that they know the gaff is okay. He's not, he, he understands. He's not driving them like slaves, really, slave horses or something. It's a, it's um, Rio, Rio Bruce. He brought discipline, really, order. He brought a plan. I think as football's developed and moved on, you have to have a plan. You have to know how you play. And your team has to have an identity and know what's expected. Every player, modern player, wants to know what their job is. Um, in the early years as a footballer, I used to think football was really tough. Because no, no manager ever told me my job, my roles, my responsibilities. I was centre-half and I tried to win headers from goal kicks, tried to win tackles, get the ball out of my box. Nobody ever gave me patterns of where to pass it, how to draw people short to drop it over the top, or how to give it to my full back to draw the wide player to get it back to stick it into the, our wide player. I'm surprised at that because I would have thought that would have been Malcolm Allison's forte. Eh? No, nothing. Nothing. None of that. Rising. And I, and I would suggest. Well, Bruce Rio like... started to bring in, uh, I think I've read before that Bruce Rio started to say, right, the goalkeeper rolls it to the full back and the full back yeah. has to pass it to the. Yeah. You know, the, he, gave us, he gave us some structure. Yeah. First manager I'd ever had, and as you say, he was number nine or ten or eight or whatever it was on my list of managers, who um, who give us a structure, who put us in position. And when the ball's here, you need to be there. And so if you think about the ball being a parky at right back, what's his options? He's got Ripper in front of him. He should have a striker, maybe Slaven come into the ball, maybe Archie on a diagonal, maybe Gary Hamilton come square of him. And then he, when he lands on it, he has to weigh up his best option. So it might be square to Gary Hamilton because their midfield player is trying to screen the forward pass into the striker. So Hammy should be in space. And so just give it to Gary and let him try and play off the strikers. If they get really tight to Hammy, there should be a passing line straight into your striker's feet. So Slav coming short with the ball. And so he started painting pictures for the players on, when you've got it, these should be your options. And if that's not on, you should move there because the defender's going to come with you. If he doesn't, you just get the ball. If he comes with you, you run in that space that's left and back you play the ball in. And so he's the first guy who made us think about football, everybody on the pitch. When you had it in certain areas, where was the space? Where were the runs? This is how we're going to play. And that's modern football, really. So Bruce was the first one who brought that in. Now, now today, you have to almost sell the game plan to your team. This is how I think the game's going to roll. This is how they play. He's going to be really aggressive and he's going to get really tight. So you bring him deep, leave the space behind. Daki, if I'm talking about my Blackburn team, you come and play behind him because he's going to want to kick Lewis Travis, get tight. So will Daki fill the space as Trav comes short, you drop in the hole and there's the pass. And get turned, you run, you stick it in the space behind him. And so you're painting pictures for the team constantly. They generally are going, yeah, yeah, right. Up. And then when you make that happen on a match day and they score they'll follow you whatever you tell them to do they'll follow you and that's what football is really you have to have the human qualities that they actually engage with you they don't have to like you you don't be, have to become their pal 
but they have to respect you and trust your knowledge. And when, because we're there to make them better. I keep saying to my, I want them all to play in the Premier League. I want them all to earn millions of pounds and look after their family and live in big houses, drive big cars. And they'll only ever do that by getting to the top. And I'm here to try and help you, make you a better player. And so the connection is, the gaffers here, is my coaches, we're here to make you a Premier League player. To, so you're earning 100 grand a week and... You'll only do that if you listen and you work hard and you understand. And when you've got questions, come and ask and we'll show you and try and make you a better player and get there together. And that's how it works. And so they trust you and they, they put their faith in you.